Welcome everybody to Cafe Conversations. Uh, this um, is sponsored by the Office of Philanthropy and Alumni and then the uh, Cafe Alumni Association as well. Uh, and today's installment actually is brought to us by Visit Lex and the UK Federal Credit Union. They are sponsors of our Alumni Association and help us stay connected with everybody. And so we appreciate their support. Uh, Today, we're gonna to look at how COVID-19 has impacted teaching. We'll look at the spring semester and then kind of look forward into the fall semester as well. Um, and kind of how we anticipate things continuing to evolve and change. So I'm Elizabeth Vaughn, uh, Senior Associate Director of Philanthropy in the college. And I have with us today, we have Dr. Carmen Agaritas, Associate Dean for Instruction. Dr. Jackie Warman, who is a lecturer in our Animal Science and Equine Science and Management program. Dr. Lou Hirsch, who is the Director of Undergraduate Studies in Agriculture and Medical Biotechnology and also teaches in Plant Pathology. And then Dr. Jason Swanson, who is our Director of Undergraduate Studies in Retailing and Tourism Management. So we'll start off maybe with Carmen kind of giving us an overview and then hear from each individual faculty member uh, kind of giving us a little bit more drilled down into your department of just how crazy things have been with this and what it did to your classes. So if you do, if you're a participant and you do have a question, uh, you can use the chat function to go ahead and submit that. And then, then at the end of kind of once every faculty member has gone through uh, their area, we'll open it up. Um, we'll actually, if you want to unmute, we'll unmute participants, but we do have everybody muted and your video is hidden right now just to kind of streamline things a little bit. So with that, Carmen, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Beth. Um, wow, shift in the spring was quick, right? It was, it, was a, it was a lot of flexibility had to be required, I think, of everyone, uh, a lot of resilience. So we were, um, I think like most people, watching the news and kind of watching what was going on around the national landscape as well. Uh, and when the president made the announcement that the university was going to be closed, I'm, I'm very proud to say of our college, we were, we were ready to kind of jump on that, that transition because we had a very short window, right? We had basically spring break for a lot of our faculty to take these very much face-to-face uh, -face courses and convert them online. So I think that that's, uh, that period was really a lot of how do we help our faculty um, get the training or the technology that they needed? as far as that transition point, but also how do we reach out to our students because we need to communicate with them kind of what's gonna happen, right? So this is, this is a big change for them um, as well. So we did a lot of uh, things within our college. So the university was doing training, but we did a lot within our college as well. So um, now we're all experts on Zoom, but at the time we weren't so much, right? So we had to kind of work through what that would look like. Um, we helped a lot of our faculty learn new techniques with the Canvas. So that's the learning management system that we use at the university. Um, and then also a lot with videos, right? So we all got to be really good at making videos and like where do you store the videos and how do you close caption those videos? So there was a lot I think that, that kind of really went there and you know our, our um, college IT people I think came through really uh, big for us, not just in training sessions. So we had, you know, drop-in training sessions or, or things like that, but also how do we make some um, more tailored how-to guides, right? You know, we don't need to know every single thing in the world about Zoom, but how do we quickly get started? And so I think there was a lot of that. There was obviously a lot in the springtime of questions regarding like pass fail. So how's that going to mean for our students? Um, we had questions on internships, you know, so we had students that were out doing internships, you know, what do we do with those students? You know, what are the, do they come back? Um, you know, and then how do we get information out rapidly to a lot of people? So there was a lot of work I know, going on at the university, but also in our college uh, for developing, you know, web resources just so we can help communicate with folks. And I'm sure everybody's email traffic uh, went up exponentially during that time as messages were, were going out. The other thing um, I have to say I was very proud of with our college is the number of people that volunteered to actually call our students. So the university had a very large campaign, obviously, because we were wanting to know how our students were doing to reach out. And our college was the first one to be able to call all of our undergraduate students and reach out to them um, and kind of see what was going on. And I thought that was wonderful because one, it showed the students that we cared, but two, it also helped us flag if there were issues and how could we try to identify them. Um, 
And, you know, and there were things that would happen, right? You know, so we would have a major rainstorm that occurred, for example, in Eastern Kentucky, and that knocked out power for a lot of our students. And so we had to, you know, quickly communicate to our faculty that if you have students in these counties, here's the ones we've identified, they're probably going to be without internet access. So how can we um, better serve them and just add some flexibility into that? And so that was a lot of that transition and we got through the spring, but we also had to kind of think about summer, right? So we do have a summer semester and I have to say our faculty, I thought, um, came up really big in that front too. So the university's done a lot of um, effort to increase summer enrollment, to give those summer opportunities for students who, you know, they're not normally going to camp. Maybe there's not the same job opportunities, but there's the opportunity, I think, for them to continue to further their education. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, we did a lot participating in like digital badges. So if you go to your favorite search engine, you can look at what digital badges we have. And we have some pretty cool ones from uh, like distillation fundamentals. There's um, environmental protection, restoration, equine management, industry fundamentals, veterinary basics, personal and family finances. So there's lots of really neat ones that students can go into. Um, but we also reached out to our high school, our future Wildcats, so to speak, uh, with an Adulting 101 course. And that one's uh, ongoing right now, but it's been a, a pretty popular course. We have close to 600 uh, high school students from across the country uh, who've enrolled in this course. And thanks to our um, faculty and also Cooperative Extension Service, uh, we've got some, uh, I think, some pretty neat topics that relate on physical and mental well-being. So that's obviously a very important topic, even more so than now. Um, but everything's from you know, like what should you or should you not post on social media? Um, how can you be a good roommate to, you know, how can you make nutritious meals to, you know, um, how do you prepare yourself better for college? So we're trying to, you know, uh, um, help those students, you know, navigate through in the summertime and see what college might be like for them. Um, the other thing I'd have to say is obviously with our increased web presence, you know, our, our um, office um, has, a new web page out there. So I think a lot of us are now learning that, you know, we can't just walk into somebody's office. We have to kind of pull that information off the web. So we have very much an outward facing, I think, web page. Um, and then we've had to think, how do we shift orientation, right? So normally our students would come on campus and visit with us. That's all virtual now. So our students go through all their, their orientation through virtually. And to me, that's a huge testament to our advisors that we have in the college who work with our students um, because they're putting in a tremendous amount of effort uh, and doing this all in, I think, a very uh, short amount of time. So going into the fall, I mean, we've learned a lot from the spring, and I think we'll we want to hear from our faculty here. You know, we're gonna we'll learn some of the things that worked out really well and things we might want to kind of change around. Um, but you know, we're we've been planning um, we've been planning for months, and we plan all the time and constantly learning new things. Um, we have a team on of, of 15 members in our college that really kind of looks at a lot of everything because uh, we have to think about our farms and all those different aspects. But for the fall, you know, we've inventoried all of our classroom spaces to figure out, you know, how social distancing will work. How do people going to come in and out of buildings? Um, we've looked at IT. So what additional technology do we need in the classroom so people can do what we're doing right now, right? They can Zoom their classes because they're gonna have some students that may be face-to-face -face in that class that day, and then they have some that might be remote. Um, so we've been looking, I think, at all that, and then how do we, um, how do we protect our faculty, you know, and how do we protect our students, their, their health, you know, with masks or, or um, you know, just pl plexiglass partitions. So we're, we're doing a lot of those things, but I have to give a huge amount of credit to our faculty because they've been really having to do the, the heavy lift uh, all through the spring, summer, and the fall semester. Great. Thanks so much, Carmen. Uh, I guess, Dr. Hirsch, do you want to jump in and can maybe talk a little bit about your experience? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Beth. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Lou Hirsch, I'm a lecturer in plant pathology and the director of undergraduate studies of uh, two programs in our college. So, agricultural medical biotechnology, which is about a 250, 300 person genetics based uh, laboratory research intensive program that really does produce some very strong students for professional schools and 
uh, careers in research, public service, government, things like that. And then also uh, director of undergraduate studies for our college's general degree program, uh, agriculture, uh, individualized curriculum. So two uh, very different and unique uh, kind of groups of students going there. Um, being an agricultural biotechnologist, which is a bit of a mouthful, but we're essentially uh, microbiologists who uh, work in agriculture. And uh, because a lot of us work with different types of pathogens and viruses specifically, uh, our faculty saw the writing on the wall earlier than spring break about what was going to happen. So we uh, initiated a lot of these important and challenging conversations early just kind of looking at what Washington State and our West Coast states were doing in the initial stages of uh, the pandemic. Um, although we didn't come to uh, satisfying answers in some cases, we at least started those conversations when we could you know, meet face to face. Um, we, so our program is challenging, but also was able to respond pretty well to this. Um, we're a small program, 250 students is, is, is small even for our college. Um, and because of that, we were able to move pretty nimbly compared to some other larger programs who have big faculty and large classes. Um, a downside of our program is that a lot of our curriculum relies on being in a lab, shoulder to shoulder with your lab partner, or in the case of research internships, conducting research. Um, and that uh, was shut down um, when a lot of our labs were, were put into different phases of social distancing. Um, and that affected our students who have a graduation requirement research project that was essentially cut off at the knees in the eighth week of a 16 week semester. So um, there were lots of movements back and forth trying to figure out what to work. But from our perspective, to get these students an experience and allow them to earn their degree, but still have some sort of mean, you know, worthwhile science experience was what to do with these beautiful research projects that through no fault of their own were now impossible to perform. So how do we triage that in a meaningful way? Um, and that was a challenge. And uh, we were some students, I mean, all the students responded well, some can analyze data remotely, which many did. Some just had to stop where they were at and then try and make the best they could with a little bit more of a, of a scientific literature review, um, things like that. Um, moving forward, uh, I, I can't speak for my, my colleagues, but I know that our program is leaning very heavily on Carmen's office and all the work she's doing uh, to provide us some guidance and help as we figure all these things out. But uh, our biggest concern moving forward is, uh, I mean, some classes can go online, that's pretty easy, but it's our research uh, classes where students have to be in the lab eight hours a week. Uh, how do we deal with that from a social distancing standpoint? Our classrooms used to be able to hold 21 students. Now they can hold eight. So we have to figure out faculty coverage, room availability, um, how to put arrow markers on the ground by the sinks so we don't get students you know, coming too close to each other. All these little things when the boots literally hit the ground that you know, probably no one really thought of until they looked at the space that these faculty and students are gonna be occupying. Um, and another, uh, just my last uh, statement for what we're doing is, uh, as I mentioned before, our program does require a um, research internship. Um, most of the time that's conducted with a researcher here on campus, either in ag or in medicine or arts and science, we dentistry throughout the whole university. Um, and a lot of those disciplines have been significantly impacted by all the coronavirus related shutdowns. Uh, ag research got an exemption because we're um, a, uh, uh, a required, uh, in, I, I'm having a, I can't remember the word, but uh, but but we were granted a lot of exemptions that, for example, my colleagues in biology were not. They were kicked out of their labs for two months. Our research was able to continue um, unabated in many cases with some different policies in place. So this semester we have about 45 students who need to find a home to conduct their research to graduate. And we're trying to figure out in the front end a lot of different ways to allow them to put in the work to earn their degree. Lots of moving parts and pieces for every single program. It's amazing just the logistics that have to go into this these days. So Dr. Warman, I'll pass it on to you. Maybe you can talk to us about, since you're from one of our bigger departments of animal science, kind of what it's looked like for you guys. Okay, sure. So back in the spring, I was teaching a few different classes, actually. I was teaching ASC 101, which is, of course, our first introductory course in uh, the animal science degree and it's also required for 
uh, students who are majoring in equine science and management and students who are majoring in um, ag education. So I, I had five lab sections of that class, of about 120 students that were taking ASC 101 in the spring. Um, in addition to that, I was also teaching our applied animal nutrition course, uh, which was formerly known as uh, feeds and feeding, if anyone remembers that from their <laughs> days back when they were animal science students, perhaps. Um, there I had two, two lab sections of that too. So all in all, I had seven labs <laughs> that were uh, being taught in the spring. And I also had a, um, a course for uh, education abroad program that was scheduled to go to France in May, which of course that didn't happen, but it was still a course that students were enrolled in for credit. So we had to find some ways to still get them some type of meaningful educational experience to earn those course credits. And um, thankfully, I had also a very large team of teaching assistants that were helping with all of my courses, well, with the ASC 101 and 380, that is. Um, a lot of them were undergraduates who were, again, earning course credit as, by serving in their role as a teaching assistant. But gosh, I'm glad I had them because it was, uh, they were really necessary. I don't know how I would have made it through without them. It was funny, after a few weeks of uh, remote teaching, I had somebody not affiliated with the university at all who said something to me like well gosh what are you doing with all your free time <laughs> i left i was like what are you talking about free time i have no free time if i hadn't had those tas i would have had even less it's hard to imagine <laughs> how, how i would have made it through but thankfully especially with um my two main courses asc 101 and 380 i have been using canvas very frequently on a on a weekly basis with my 101 course in particular and I was also using it as a place to kind of consolidate all my course materials for both of my classes to be able to go there to find notes, homework assignments, study guides, things like that. So they were already really familiar with um, using Canvas for my courses. So then whenever we had to switch to completely remote, uh, it was a pretty easy transition I think for for my courses but um, it was still took a whole lot of effort to put things that would not have been online uh, in an online format and I was thinking to myself gosh I, I, I don't have to drive 30 minutes to, to work in 30 minutes home so there's an hour a day that I save and I have all these lab sections I don't have to teach them multiple times I just have to prepare them once and do it I'm going to save that much time there I don't know where all the time went <laughs> I didn't feel like I had any time saved at all but <laughs> it was um it was a whirlwind but it was certainly um good in some aspects too to kind of get all of these course materials put in a format that I think is going to be useful for this coming semester as well because it looks like we're not out of the woods yet by any stretch of the imagination so um, it was a useful thing but I, I did feel bad for a lot of the students some of them adapted to it a lot better than others there were some that really struggled um, so I tried and I know a lot of my colleagues tried to just be as adaptable and flexible that we could recognizing that none of the students signed up to take courses in this manner. And so we tried to keep that in mind. If they needed a little extra time or if they needed special accommodations or something like that, it, perhaps maybe some of their other courses were not quite as flexible. And I was happy to provide as much flexibility as I could. Um, I think some of that's going to end though come next semester because <laughs> we are not forcing them to do this online come fall. But um, still there'll be some degree of difference in the way the expectations that we have in an in-person classroom versus an online classroom but um, I, I'm looking forward to doing it um, some of the things that are challenging in our disciplines animal science equine science things like that is that we do have a lot of lab courses so finding ways to give them meaningful experiences when maybe the hands-on component is not going to be feasible um, a lot of use of videos, um, trying to get them to actually interact and not simply watch videos by like zooming like we're doing right now or having um, to some type of one-on-one -on -one or group conversation so that we can have some kind of interaction is going to be really important. And I think that some of that didn't happen to a great degree when we made a quick switch. And so I think that's something that a lot of us are aiming to 
do a whole lot more of when we approach fall semester. Yeah, I think flexibility was that key word in this spring, both for students and for faculty members. I think all of us had to learn, you know, new ways of doing things and that that flexibility was key. And I think we saw that across the university as well. So Dr. Swanson, you want to talk a little bit about your experience this spring and kind of going forward? Sure. Thanks, Beth. So I represent the Department of Retailing and Tourism Management, and we had we had a pretty big advantage going into this online experience because a lot of our classes are already online, including we have a fully online um, master's program. So a lot of the faculty in my department have experience teaching online if they weren't already doing that uh, last semester. My two classes last semester, one of them was already online. So that transition was easy. And the other class that I was teaching, which is part of the distillation certificate, my class is uh, called Beer, Wine, Spirits, and Tourism. So that class was um, converting to become online this fall semester. So even though it was taught face-to-face -face in the spring, a lot I've, I'd already done a lot of the work to make it online, including traveling around with um, Brian Vollen from AgCom. He would go on our field trips and he'd already shot video and turned some of those previous experiences into virtual tours that I was going to use in the fall and I will use in the fall, but I was able to use some of those uh, field trips that he covered for the actual spring semester when we did go fully online. The day that it was announced that we would be online, at least for a short term, uh, my, that class had a field trip. So we were leaving that afternoon on a bus, coming back knowing that, well, we only knew that we would be out for two weeks at the time, but that was that was my last experience in the classroom was actually a field trip going to some breweries in Frankfurt. So fond memories, I guess. Hopefully we get to do that again sometime. But our, like I said, our transition was a little bit easier. And I appreciate what Jackie said about lack of time, having uh, not much time to do stuff or you don't, partially because what, what was hard for me personally and a lot of other of my colleagues, I'm sure, is we were home, but we were also home with our kids who were not in school. So I have a one and a half year old and a five year old. My wife works, she's a professor at Center College. So we were doing basically splitting days and that was really what made it a lot harder. Even though I, I was in a pretty good spot with my classes, the, just the lack of time, the change in the working day for, for me personally and for a lot of my colleagues would, made it a big struggle. But one of our big challenges within the department is we, we do require an internship. So we, we require students to get out there and basically get jobs for the summer as part of their graduation requirement. We had about 40 students who needed to do that in order to graduate in the spring or in the summer. And these are two industries that were hit particularly hard, retailing, but even more so hospitality and tourism. So students who may have secured internships in February and March were suddenly you know, they were falling away because hotels were laying off most of their employees, some restaurants were closing, event planners were going out of business. So that, that created an opportunity for us to kind of get creative with some of the uh, ways to meet those needs. And in continuing that thought, as the students who were graduating and did graduate, they were in, entering an industry that was completely changed, changing, and we still don't understand what it's going to look like, I think. But that's, that's been a big challenge for our recent alums. And it'll be interesting to see uh, when we start talking to freshmen and younger students, sophomores, about what they think about the future of our industry. So I'm looking forward to those discussions that we'll have in the fall about that. Great, thank you. I know across the college, internships and you know shadowing and all of those kind of pieces, they seem to be, every department is trying to figure out you know how to handle a lot of those and you know it's it, I guess to some degree I knew how much of that happened but you really sort of I think this crisis brought it to the forefront of how many of our departments have students out in experiential learning opportunities and it has given us the opportunity to get creative I get that's maybe the best way to look at it so well, we'll dive in. We had some questions pre-submitted, um, so we'll go ahead and dive in with a few of those. And so you guys talked a little bit about this, but what were some of your biggest challenges in having to go to online teaching 
versus sort of the traditional in the classroom. Was there any one thing in particular that stood out? Yeah, well, I could jump in here first. Uh, so I taught two classes, uh, a um, about a 60 person lecture lab class for freshmen um, called Genetics and Society, and then a senior level capstone class that I co-taught with Dr. Argarita. So I got to see students on both ends of the spectrum, students who had just moved out of home for the first time, were nine, you know, 18, 19 years old, and then all of a sudden had to move back to their uh, hometown. So there was a lot of sort of social, personal issues going on with that. Um, and then amongst the seniors, uh, they had a similar sort of situation, but they also had to abandon leases. They had jobs that they got fired or furloughed from. They were very much concerned about their career prospects, you know, two months in the future, um, and uh, felt in the tumult of everything closing, uh, not abandoned by any stretch, but just they lost that connection that they were really leaning on on the last couple months of their college career, you know, to get them out the door. Um, so they had a whole set of other different problems. Um, I think the biggest issue for me and the classes and my colleagues who I've spoken with was trying to keep students engaged. Um, and I know a lot of classes and, and not many in ag that I'm aware of, but across other places on campus, um, really just kind of dumped a bunch of assignments on Canvas and the, the teachers just kind of pieced out and didn't really uh, help their students through the process. Um, and all the class, I, I still required or uh, at least incentivized uh, personal attendance, and that was really big. Uh, so a surprising number of my students said all of their classes went uh, just kind of, it's, we call it asynchronous, meaning you can just do it whenever and then turn in all your assignments, you know, Sunday night or something like that. Uh, so there's no direct uh, accountability. And my students liked having a time to log on. They liked the schedule uh, and they liked the connection. Um, but something that I, I observed across every, everything I've seen and all my colleagues have shared this with me is that it was really hard to elicit feedback and live conversation with people over the internet. Uh, some of that was because they turned their cameras off for whatever reason. Uh, but a lot of it, even if I would throw out a question in a face-to-face -face class, somebody would answer it eventually but it's a lot more comfortable to sit quietly in your pajamas looking at a screen and not answering and that was hard to elicit that sort of feedback that i think is really a hallmark and a, like the valuable teaching component of a residential campus like uk um yeah so just to summarize it was just making connections that's hard enough to do face to face really hard to do in everything that happened over over spring break Yeah, absolutely. I know I had the opportunity. I was one of those callers that Carmen mentioned to talk to students and I was amazed. You know, I think we always think of students as this online generation, but they were kind of echoing the same thing of I miss being in a classroom. I miss being with people. I miss those connections. And it's, you know, the first few times I heard it, I wasn't certain I was understanding correctly because again, we think of them as just this really online generation. But I think exactly to your point, Lou, that We've learned so much how we value those connections and seeing other people. So this has been a good learning opportunity for that. I guess kind of the flip side of that question, we had somebody submit a question asking about what was the best thing or the unexpected benefit maybe from flipping to this online? So I was going to chime in on this one, I think. So um, I think one of the things that I'm going to take away from this and use in the future is that it, in preparing all of these things to be delivered in a remote fashion, it's making a whole library worth of materials that I'll be able to use at any time in the future, which is great. Um, I really need to knock on wood for the statement that I have never missed a day of work for being sick or hurt or car accident or anything. I've never missed a day of work for that. And if I was to have to miss a lecture, it would throw off my whole schedule. <laughs> and so now if something does happen, I'm not able to come to work for some awful reason, then I can say, okay, 
wasn't able to make it, but here's the materials and you can um, view at your own time or have it done by this day or something like that. Um, I think there's going to be a great benefit in having all this stuff prepared to deliver in a way that doesn't require your presence. Um, another benefit too is going to be that sometimes that's the case for students, that students are not able to be there. And of course, if they have an excused absence, then we're expected to give them an accommodation to make up that material. And sometimes in the past, it would be something that was just as close as you could make it, you know? Um, or maybe you would have a day when you could do makeup assignments or a makeup lab, and that got very time consuming and difficult to schedule. And so now I'll, I'll have a as I said, a library of materials to choose from to in order to facilitate makeup assignments of actual course materials that's very, very, very similar to what they would have had in an in-person experience. I agree with what Jackie's saying. Along those lines, I think for me, it's helping me to be, to communicate in a more efficient and organized way because I've got to lay out everything and even in terms of rubrics, of so strength and rubrics, of strength and assignments because it's a lot harder I think to, well, I, I need to be more intentional about explaining it well so they can go back and look at it as opposed to just talking through it in class. So it, I spent, I've noticed I've spent a little bit more time as I prepare for the fall in making sure that everything's as clear as possible. And also to uh, Lou's earlier point about participation in class, one of my colleagues, George Ward, who teaches as an adjunct in our, our department, um, he teaches a class in the spring semester. And so he had to do the same pivot. If you don't know George, he's a charge of real estate for UK and he teaches our entrepreneurship class. He he's, uh, has a background in hotel development. He, it's a very good class and he's a very popular instructor, but he and I talked about what that pivot would look like for him and he chose to do it synchronously and he keeps them in class for two and a half hours every Monday until it's a, it's a night class. So he's always done that and he did the same thing in, on Canvas, but what he, found, what he found out was after the class was over, students wanted to stick around because as Lou said that was one of they didn't have a whole lot of synchronous classes and that's how he was teaching it so they wanted to stick around and just talk to each other so they had this forum and this opportunity to have a chat and ultimately George would do he would just say I've got to go to bed y'all you know I'll keep talking and I'm going to move on but they he noticed that and I think that's an important part it's an important way for students to maintain that connection in class if they can all get together yeah. yeah. And then, uh, then Beth, if I could just jump into uh, Jason and Jackie's comments kind of brought me to a thought that uh, I think every faculty member who cares about their teaching always does a lot of self reflection to think about, well, what worked today? What didn't work today? What works with this class? What doesn't work with this class? And we all probably come up with a fantastic list of really great improvements for our material at the end of the semester that then gets probably folded into our email inbox and forgotten and never really incorporated well into the class when the rubber meets the road and it's time to you know develop things for the upcoming semester just because I think we're all you know we're all slaves to our inboxes and get too busy. Um, but for me this this opportunity because things must be redone and and they have to be redone by you know August 17th when we start again. Uh, it's really kind of taking my the schedule boot off my neck, if you will, to let me breathe a little bit and actually focus on curriculum improvement and freeing myself for the time to do it, rather than just be just you know overcome by all the responsibilities that that sadly get in the way of that sometimes. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think. You know, it, it, this has just been a huge learning experience for everybody. So it's good to see that we are getting some positives from it. We have an audience question um, from Sue Whitaker, who's the president of our alumni association for the college. So I'm going to try to unmute her. I think we've done that. Sue, are you online with us? I am. All right. Well, go right ahead with your question. Okay, I had submitted a couple of questions earlier, but uh, in hearing the conversation, I think those were pretty well answered. But I did come up with a couple of other questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, and now I've forgotten who alluded to this, but one of you said something about the expectations being different in class uh, when they're in class or in person class as to an online class. And I guess I was wondering why the difference and what kind of differences. And, um, you know, I know perhaps, you know, some of the things that you would do would be different, 
but I, I guess I'm not quite sure how expectations of what of the students, how that would be different. So I don't know who would like to take that one. And if you want to hear my other question while you're thinking about that, uh, and this one is probably directed to uh, Jason. Um, and hi, Jason. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, we served on a task force together. Uh, but what are some of the things you alluded to the fact that students may need to know some different things now as they go out into the workplace? What are some of these things and how are you going to incorporate those in future classes? I'll answer Sue's second question. It's good to see you, Sue, always. Uh, one thing in, in my particular industry, hospitality and tourism, and specifically event planning, which a lot of the students are interested in. So if, they're, if we're helping them learn about this career, meeting and events are changing in a big way going forward. And so there's going to be fewer in-person meetings and more virtual meetings. So that technology aspect is something that we need to improve on in terms of teaching people what what it means to put on a virtual conference. I, I had some conversations this summer with some hotel folks around the state and they were trying to figure that out themselves. So they have meeting space they're trying to fill. They can't fill it, but they're, some of their attendees want to do these meetings virtually. So they have to figure out how, essentially how they're gonna monetize that and make money off of these virtual meetings when it's just not something that they, they've done before. So. From an industry standpoint, that's just one example of how we're gonna to have to learn. We're all learning how to do this, and then we have to teach students on how to think about it in, in the future. But I think part of what that would do and what we would do in terms of the classes uh, is change some of the requirements. So we may have, you know, we have papers that are due and we may have presentations. I think we're gonna to have to start doing Zoom meetings as part of the class requirements, even if it is a face-to-face -face class, because as Carmen said, we did, we learned a lot since March. Part of that is because we hadn't had to rely on that technology, but I don't, I personally don't think it's gonna go away. So we need to train students, at least as part of the communication, and maybe it, it expands into the um, other communication classes around campus, as we got we all need to know how to do that. And then uh, Sue Lou Hirsch here, uh, if I could ask a clarification for your question, and, and, and I think I have an answer for both ways it could go, but you asked about different expectations. Which direction does that go? Do you mean different expectations that students have of faculty or different expectations that faculty have of students? Well, I, I thought I understood that faculty was having different expectations of expectations of students if they were in class or if they were online are like in the Zoom. That was the way I understood. Now, maybe I misunderstood what someone was saying. Uh, well, I, I think I did touch on that point. Um, for, for me, and I guess this really just depends on the nature of the class, but mine is not a uh, uh, you know, forward-facing lecture sort of you know, stage on the stage sort of model. I'm very much having small group out, you know, breakout sections, students. It's very much back and forth. Um, and uh, I, I really do expect the students to participate live. I've just noted that that is harder to elicit over these digital interfaces. Um, and I've come up with lots of different approaches and I think some of them are rather gimmicky to try and you know, improve that dynamic. Um, but one note that, that I'm, I'm hearing that, that I don't think you asked, but I think is worth being said, is that students also have different expectations now. Because I think as much as universities like Kentucky offer an education, we also offer an experience as part of the package that is being diminished now by a lot of these social distancing um, guidelines. So I think students are still paying the same sticker price. And as they take on loans to subsidize their college career, they're more aware of the long-term um, you know, issues associated with those loans. And I think they're becoming more savvy consumers of education. So, um, and everyone's gonna do this different, but I've made myself uh, probably uncomfortably available to the students through various digital uh, mechanisms so they can uh, get in touch with me, uh, kind of like digital office hours, but more, uh, more frequent, uh, just so they can have a connection that I think, uh, you know, it's kind of diminished through the through the Zoom interface. So hopefully some of those ramblings address some of your questions. And sort of along those lines, someone had submitted a question to us, you know, 
we do a lot to acclimate students to campus, particularly freshman students. And maybe Carmen, this might be best for you, but since we do have these social distancing guidelines in place, you know, are, what are the plans for this fall to try to help those freshmen adjust? I mean, I don't know if we're still able to do our living learning program. What do those look like? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and it's a, a lot of them is, are still kind of evolving as we go through. So while we do, for example, um, summer orientation, so those are things that are done online and each individual program may have other aspects in which they can connect up to the students. Um, when it comes to our living learning program, we're thinking very uh, carefully about what it is that we can do with our students, right? So for example, um, at the start of the semester, a lot of times we would take our students out to South Farm, let them tour that area, have a barbecue out there and do lots of things like that. Well, that's probably not going to be uh, as easily possible this fall. So we're trying to figure out how do we engage those students. Um, we were trying to figure out, for example, how do we do our college meeting? So in the past, they would come in to see auditorium. It would be really filled. We'd go out on Garagas Plaza. Well, we're not going to be able to do it quite like that. So we're thinking, okay, can we do smaller group to those type interactions? So this is something we're spending a lot of time um, thinking about, and not only at the university, but also at the college, of how do we give students these really meaningful experiences? And as, you know, as every one of the, the faculty on here have alluded to, you know, that's a big part of their education. So we're really focusing on that. And like, how do we handle student organizations and, and things of that nature? We, we don't want to get into a situation where a student comes into campus, they don't leave their dorm because they're doing everything online or something like that, right? So we want them to be able to get out and interact and have those experiences and doing it in a safe way. Um, it is, again, it's still an evolving process of how that, that's going, um, but you know, we're, we're really looking a lot to our departments and they're gonna have their own cultures with inside of there and their own activities that they're gonna be doing with their students to, to help them find their place within the college. So, Kind of still looking forward to this fall, you know, of course, we are doing everything possible to have students back on campus trying to do it all in a safe manner. I know there have been some articles, you know, from some other universities. I know I've read a couple about some universities not requiring masks and a few other things with faculty actually being concerned about being exposed in the classroom. Can you maybe talk a little bit, Carmen, um, and maybe uh, other faculty members, if you want to jump in as well, kind of just what, you know, what measures are we taking to keep faculty safe as well and students and kind of what are we asking everybody to do? Obviously, we've mentioned social distancing. Are, are we having other policies? What are our plans there? Yeah, so we do, and I know the university is developing some of their more global type ones, but in the college, we've, we've taken this very seriously and listened to our faculty, and so um, we do have some faculty that may, because of health concerns, um, wish to teach online, and, you know, I've done our best to, to honor some of those requests that they've had. Um, masks are going to be mandatory, so all students are going to have to wear their masks, and we're we're um, working on within the college on maybe some ways to do a better job of helping to enforce some of that. Um, our departments have done a, a fantastic job of helping also plan, for example, um, how would they want people to move around in the buildings? You know, so we're trying to figure out that, you know, what are those hallway pathways, um, elevators and things like that. There's going to be a lot of uh, signage placed up. Um, we're going to be removing uh, desks out of classrooms. So if a classroom, for example, in the past held 40 students, and now maybe it only held, holds, um, just make up a number like 20, we're going to be removing those desks so that, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to, uh, to over sit, so to speak, or sit where you shouldn't. Um, for those facilities that are auditoriums, so they're going to have seating blocked off, so, you know, you can only sit in certain locations. Um, the university is looking to clean the rooms daily, so the classrooms that we have. Uh, and then also we'll have, you know, hand sanitizer all around. There'll be, uh, they're going to be supplying cleaning wipes and things like that. So um, we've taken it very seriously. You know, we've, we've ordered um, a lot of uh, plexiglass kind of partitions for the room. So for, for, we're listening to our faculty when they're saying that these things are, these things are stuff that we would like to have in there. We're, we're trying to do our best to accommodate those because we take everybody's health very, very seriously in the college. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's, I've heard some just different 
not just within UK, but just the cost of cleaning now and how much organizations are spending to have things cleaned. And it's amazing, but it's, it's critical. We have to do it. So yeah. I see. And I would just want to say one more thing too, is the, one of the nice things we also have on our end of the college is a lot of outdoor spaces for, for classrooms. And that's something we're also trying to do a better job of educating our faculty on and coordinating. Um, so that's one of the nice things about on the South end of campus is that we are trying to encourage that if you can't get the students outdoors, let's try to do that. Yeah, absolutely. We have some beautiful spots out and around this side of campus. So uh, we can take advantage. I see Dr. Aaron submitted a question here asking about testing and doing exams online and maybe some challenges around those. And I know we may not be that far in the planning process, but you know, what are we planning anything different? I know, I think UK has said all finals will be remote. So what is that kind of looking like? Yeah, good question. Um, so there's a variety of different strategies faculty can take. So some faculty may choose to do more project-based where it's not so much a, you know, the, um, it's a lot harder to say cheat on that or a bit more obvious. Um, the, the, the university was using one proctoring type of software called Respondus. I think after feedback, uh, that they've gotten, they're looking to bump up a different type of software that allows, I think, a little bit more rigorous proctoring in that, ProctorU. Um, so that has been a big question for a lot of um, faculty is how do we ensure academic integrity uh, within our exams, but also keep in mind that when students go home and they take these exams, their internet service may be a little bit differently. So how would you accommodate somebody who may not be able to have that camera live while they're doing it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have a couple questions submitted by Pam McFarland, and so I'm going to try to unmute her the same way we did with Sue and let Pam, if you're with us, you can go ahead with your questions. Ah, uh, Yes, I'm here. Um, <clears throat> so my question is kind of more of a discussion, and it could be something that um, I talked to uh, with Carmen about, but with internships, obviously we've been talking about internships. Everybody seems to have uh, different types of internships. Um, uh, obviously I've got family sciences uh, internships this fall. Um, and I'm wondering if there's other groups, other departments or majors that are like family sciences, i.e. Um, community leadership development where they're doing, uh, you know, a hands-on out in the community. Um, for So, you know, what, if we could get together to establish some consistency regarding future uh, internships, if they need to go remote again. Um, this past spring, obviously, some or most of my internships had to go uh, there was no internship because their uh, previous agency, uh, you know, employer, if you will, shut down. So they, so we had to come up with some alternative assignments. And uh, my department uh, was kind enough to share with me some options, but it would be good to have a uh, roundtable or whatever to start discussing this, so that in the future, if we go back to remote, which it probably will happen before this whole thing is over with. Uh, we, you know, that these uh, alternative assignments or whatever is purposeful, uh, very intentional, so that they're getting a lot out of uh, their experience in order to graduate. That was a mouthful. So maybe that's kind of to, uh, directed towards Carmen? Yeah, um, so you hit on a good question, which was that's with internships. Um, so right now there is an approval process for the fall um, internships, and we've asked that that um, come back to the college level for us to be able to do that. So departments that are uh, wanting to, you know, have internships off campus where the university wants to make sure um, that we're managing the risk to the student as best we can, right? And that the student is aware of, um, you know, the possibility of contracting COVID. So there's there's a there's a long process that which we will interact with those the faculty and the students to kind of collect that information. And right now, 
it goes up to um, the universities like emergency management team to review and we're asking that come back to the college for that. Um, I do think you make a very good point about the internships, right? So this spring there were a lot of examples put out to say here might be things that you could do. Um, but I think this is also a good case of where hearing from other faculty members about, okay, well, what did you do uh, in, your certain, in, in certain situations when your student couldn't complete an internship? Um, I think that's something that would be good for faculty members to kind of share that this worked well for us and then this did not. And along those lines, you know, we've talked about students working together and student group projects. I know we have lots of faculty across the college that work together. How are faculty handling, you know, just working, collaborating across all of this social distancing and remoteness? It hasn't changed the way that I do stuff really. Um, and I'm not in a lab with, with other colleagues. So most of my collaboration is if it's somebody off campus, we're um, talking on the phone or meeting at a conference. So it, for me, that's not going to make a, make a big impact. I'll, I'll miss popping in. If I can't do it, I will miss being able to pop into my colleague's office from time to time. And also miss having lunch with people. So I like to do that. Um, but if we, you know, if we can't do that, for at least for what I need to do in terms of research, it, it's not too hard to make it happen. Yeah, to, to kind of follow up on Jason's thing, I think that, that I mean, as busy as, as all of us are, like I, I still have lunch with a lot of my colleagues uh, or had lunch with my colleagues, uh, you know, a couple times a week, just kind of informally in our little break room in our department. And that was incredibly valuable. And I don't know, so that's not going to happen anymore. And that has a lot of value. Um, but I also don't know how, you know, we can't schedule that sort of thing. So I think that does have a real cost. And as faculty, we're going to have to figure out a way to maintain just the informal relationships that really, I think, drive most of our neat innovation is just a conversation we have over a sandwich rather than a scheduled Zoom call at 2.30 or something like that. So that's an issue that I think we'll, we'll notice real hard in about a month and a half when it goes away. And then hopefully we'll all start to make motions towards, I don't know, something that satisfies that itch that we all need to just collaborate and be friendly with each other. And jumping back just a little bit, Carmen, you had touched on specifically the ProctorU um, software that gave up some of our students some challenges. And I know I see Susan Skies from Ag Econ has made a comment on here saying she had several students that it caused bandwidth issues for them. I know even in using Zoom, occasionally we have people with issues that are happening. Is there anything the university's done? I know I heard something about sending out hotspots early on to some students, but anything else the university's done to help those students? Because we do particularly, in Eastern Kentucky and several of our more uh, rural counties around the state, I know there are a lot of issues with high-speed internet access and to use a lot of the technologies we've talked about, you do need a really good connection. So anything we've done to help those students in particular? Uh, yeah, so um, one of the nice things about Kentucky is the uh, every one of our counties, we have cooperative extension service. Um, so uh, I know early on Laura Stevenson, you know, that was something that we had talked about as well as could students, you know, if, depending on where they're at, you know, because it depends on where you're at in your county and things like that. Could they potentially uh, go up to, say, a, a, the Cooperative Extension Office and maybe be in their car parked there and have that? I mean, it's not an ideal testing location by any means, um, but is that a potential way to do it? I know in the spring, I've talked a lot with faculty about, well, um, is there another way that you can assess your students besides a proctored exam? And so I think that's something as well that, that we um, are going to have to, with faculty, have those discussions when they go into the fall. And I think faculty, I think it's going to be important that they do talk with their students um, that are in their classes and kind of figure out, you know, what are those potential issues? And it is something that there is not a clear and easy answer or in a one size fits all for anything. Um, I do know, like I said, after the spring and hearing, back from respondents, the university, I think is looking to invest more in ProctorU as one option. Um, but there are multiple ways that you can assess the, the knowledge that a student has. And, and so I think we're gonna continue on with those conversations as we go, go into to the fall. Um, 
but they have the university, you know, they, they tried supplying, you know, um, some like MIFIs for some students. And, but there's also, you know, just other challenges that happen, right? So, you know, um, Lou was talking about a class that we taught together this spring. And it was interesting talking to the students that some of them were like, well, my mom and dad are now home here too, and they're trying to work and we're all competing for the same bandwidth. Or, you know, you know so I think there's, there's lots of challenges. And, and like I said, there's no easy solution, but um, I think a lot of our faculty, you know, there, our faculty are really committed to trying to figure out how to work and help with students. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to keep having these conversations with them and keep trying to figure out how we can do things better. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of, we're sort of getting close to the end of our time here. So I'm going to just sort of ask maybe a broad wrap up question if, you know, what do you guys see? I mean, I think we'll see permanent changes from this pandemic across lots of parts of our lives, you know, everything from who knows if we'll ever shake hands again to how we travel, how we move through the world. But what do you guys see as the long term maybe implication or some things that you could see changing just in how courses are delivered, you know, going forward, even when we are allowed, when it's totally safe to sit shoulder to shoulder or, you know, work with your lab partner? Do you see long term effects from this? Yeah, I could just jump in with my 10 cents here. Um, I think that we've just over the course of the thousands of years we've taught, like how we've taught, you know, in, until spring break, uh, got really used to and comfortable with the ease of face-to-face -face communication and took it for granted. So I think now students are going to be more savvy and are going to expect um, more online options, but also I think value um, and come to value and see the, the real power of a face-to-face -face interaction. And I think that these sort of opportunities now, as we kind of move more into the digital space as a faculty, will let us refine those a little bit. But I think once we're able to, or to what extent we can now, do a face-to-face -face class, because we don't know when that will end, um, and it could end very quickly, we're gonna try and make those experiences as valuable as possible. So I think this whole experience of COVID-19 and all, the, all of the university's response to it is really gonna require us to kind of finally hone our classes to be maximally impactful, whether they're online or in person. And I think there's a lot of value to that. I would just kind of echo, uh, I think, what Lou said. So at the college level, you know, when we saw this happen in the spring, it was pretty, you know, it was obviously a quick transition for everybody. Um, but to try to help our faculty for the summer and the fall, you know, we've recognized that your online presence has got to be a bit more savvy. You know, our students are going to expect that. And so we've uh, developed, you know, a Canvas template for our, our, um, our, uh, our instructors, largely because there's also some different metrics that the university is looking for us to meet with regard to accessibility and certain components in there. And I think our goal is really to kind of help streamline that process a little bit more. Um, I think a lot of us, and I think it was mentioned early, took for granted, I think that our students were a lot more technologically savvy in some cases. Some of them very much were, and then some others, it was, you know, it was a new frontier for them as well. Um, but I do think, I do think, and I agree with Lou, I think it's going to make us a bit more intentional in how we lay out things. Um, and I think it's going to make us a bit more intentional in how we design that online presence. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us today. We did record this session, so if any of our participants missed anything, we'll send it out to you guys as well as post it on our uh, cafe alumni website um, and then I hope everybody will join us I'm gonna double check my make sure I get this correct August 13th at 2 30 p.m. will be our next installation of cafe conversations and we'll be talking with cooperative extension and talking about all the changes that they have made to answer the need um, of all of our counties and all of our community members during this pandemic so Again, thank you to everybody for joining us. Thank you to all of our faculty members for carving out some time with us. I know you guys are feverishly getting ready for August 17th, so we appreciate that very much. And I look forward to seeing everybody from a distance on campus in just a few months. So thank you all again and have a good afternoon.